NYSC Amex was originally uh, a, a bunch of guys standing outside on the, on the street. The New York Stock Exchange was founded in 1792, uh, and they quickly got a building and moved indoors and started trading in a more organized fashion. But not everybody qualified for or wanted to subject themselves to the rules that applied when you traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so those who didn't qualify or, or didn't want to live in that regulatory environment stayed outside and traded on the street, became known as the curbstone brokers in the early 19th century. And they stayed on the street for a really long time. This photo was taken in 1908. There was still trading going on. This is at the corner of a Wall and Broad Street. Hundreds and hundreds of people standing outside, the curbstone brokers. In 1921, they finally decided, you know, maybe we don't want to stand out here and trade in the snow and the heat. And they got a building and they moved indoors. Became known as the New York Curb Market. Renamed the American Stock Exchange. Became known as the Amex in 1953. Uh, and launched an options market in 1975, just shortly after the CBOE, and the Amex became the second options exchange in the US. Uh, 2009, NYSE bought the Amex, uh, and so those guys who were standing outside in the street and never quite could get into the, into the building finally came in from the cold. So now on to kind of the meat of what I wanted to talk about. How to build an options trading system, and, and why it's interesting and why it's probably difficult. Really three pieces to an automated trading system, again, focusing on options. Number one, what's it worth? What's the theoretical value of each option that you might think about trading. And, and as you may know, options values are really based on volatility, right? It's, it's like an insurance product. You're willing to pay a lot more for fire insurance if you think there's a high probability that there's going to be a fire. You're willing to pay a lot more for the portfolio protection represented by options if you think that your portfolio may be at risk because the underlying asset, stock, commodity, oil, whatever, interest rates may be volatile. Number two, what trade should I make? Great. I know what every option is worth because I've got a great volatility forecast. Which one should I actually buy and sell? And this is way more complicated than I think a lot of people realize, making that decision correctly. And finally, OK, I've traded. Now, how do I manage my risk? You know, what if the market moves adversely? How do I keep my capital preserved? Uh, how do I uh, make sure that the level of risk I have in my portfolio is acceptable? You're estimating parameters. So you've got to come up with some numbers that describe the universe based on data that fit that model. To do that, you've got to pick some historical data. Well, it's really critical to pick the right period of historical data. And this is a very difficult problem to solve. If I'm looking back in time here and I'm using, I think this goes back to 08, the big shock on the left is, is an 08. If you stop just short of that, right, you're going to see this nice, smooth, upward sloping line. And I think these are uh, E-mini e S&P futures or something traded on the CME. If you include that in your data set, you know, a, a fifth of, of the time period included in the data, volatility was really high. You're going to get totally different parameters for your model. And if you plug in current data and say, what should the volatility be, you're going to get a much bigger number. And because higher volatility means options are worth more, you plug that into your trading system, you're going to want to buy a whole bunch of options. So, so choosing the yellow window versus the blue window for your historical data will result in making completely different trades. And how do you know which one is right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult problem to solve correctly, and, and, and it's hard to defend the answer in kind of a quantitative way. So people spend a lot of time worrying about this. So that's one thing, one challenge. Two, the trade selection problem. Let's pretend that we have perfectly solved the, the first step, and we are the best volatility forecasters in the world, and we know exactly what every option is worth. Great. What trade do we actually want to make? Here's an option that expires tomorrow. It's trading at 10 cents, and I think it's worth 18. There's another one that expires tomorrow. It's trading at 5 cents and I think it's worth six. So it's cheaper. I don't have to tie, tie up as much capital to buy it, but my return won't be as great. Here's another option. It expires in a year. It's offered at 80 cents, and I think it's worth $8. And I'm really confident because I'm very good at modeling uh, uh, options. So I've got a million dollars to invest. What do I do? This is very difficult to think about, right? Because, well, I could, I could pour all my money into option Z, and, and I expect to make 10x my, what I invest. But maybe there's more uncertainty there. Right? Or maybe I'm very certain, but in the short term, I know that I can go from 10 to 18 cents with, with, with my investment if, if, between today and tomorrow, and then maybe tomorrow, then I can turn around and invest some money in option Z. But maybe by tomorrow, option Z is trading at three bucks. And so a big chunk of the money I thought I was going to make is gone, right? Because I missed an opportunity because I was making a, a different short-term investment. So 
the, the, the path from valuation to knowing what trade to make is complicated. So we'll talk about algorithms for a second. There, there's something in computer science, I'm not making this up, it's real technical nomenclature, called a greedy algorithm. A greedy algorithm is an algorithm that says, I'm going to make all my decisions based on what is the best thing to do right now based on local data, right? I'll make each decision in isolation based on local information. So here we have someone who wants to get as high as he can get. And he's kind of standing on the slope of a little hill to his left, but there's a big mountain to the right. If he were using a greedy algorithm to make a decision about what to do, which way is he going to go? He's going to go left, right? Woohoo, right? This is, this, is, this is what greedy algorithms get you. And, and, and by the way, there's a place for them. They're simple, right? And, and in some decision-making processes, you can get to a reasonably good outcome, maybe, or you can get there quickly. Uh, but you don't get to the global optimum. You don't get to the best possible result. So one way of solving the trade selection problem I spoke about a minute ago might be use a greedy algorithm and just kind of say, what's the best trade I can make right now? Rank all the trades, make the best one, and keep doing that. And the problem is you don't often end up with the best portfolio, right? At the end of the day, after you make a 1,000 trades that look like the best trade at the moment, you don't end up with necessarily with the best optimized position. So there are more sophisticated approaches. Linear programming is one. Uh, it's, a, it's an optimization approach. You have certain constraints, capital, risk. Plug them into a linear programming algorithm. It'll tell you, here's your target position. Here's the optimized position given the constraints that you've put into the, into the algorithm. Um, so anyway, it's one, one possible way to take steps towards solving the very difficult trade selection program is, is with techniques like this, which if you're interested, you know, uh, there's, some, there's some good stuff on Wikipedia. Quickly, impact of liquidity on forecasting. So we are great at forecasting volatility. Again, there's an Apple option. Uh, it's trading with a bid of $5 and an offer of $5.05. And I know it's worth $6. But it's really trading a lot, right? So, so market makers are, are paying 5 and selling at 505 And they're doing it all day long because investors are coming in and saying, oh, I'll pay 505 for that. Another investor comes in and says, well, I own it and I bought it at four, I'll sell it at five. And so the market makers, the professional traders on the other side of that are making a nickel every single time that happens. If I'm really, really smart and I know that this thing is worth six, I'm not going to be willing to sell it at 505, right? Well, if I'm not willing to sell it at 505, I can miss the opportunity to make a nickel all day over and over and over. And at the end of the day, if I made a million nickels, that's what, $50,000. And I'm so smart, all I'm doing is buying it and waiting for it to go to six. And I've made zero dollars today, right? So if something is really liquid, what it's worth tomorrow matters a lot less. And this is something that can be quantified and built into a trading system, right? This thing is trading a lot. I'm really confident that tomorrow, next week, in a year, it's going to be here. But in the meantime, you know what? It's trading so much, it's so liquid. Forget that. I'm going to provide liquidity and try to capture a liquidity premium by making that nickel all day long, even though I know I really shouldn't be selling it at 505 after buying it at five, because it's going to be higher tomorrow. Finally, risk, third step, risk measurement. Typical way of thinking about risk in a portfolio. You can come up with a standard deviation of your uh, portfolio value expected over time. If that's a big number, you've got a lot of risk. If it's a small number, maybe you don't have a lot of risk. That's the standard way of thinking about it. Well, there are some troubles. there's some troubles with thinking about risk in that way, particularly for asset classes like derivatives that have nonlinear payouts. <coughs> Excuse me. So you think about a derivative portfolio, there's a chance that uh, your portfolio could be worth a heck of a lot more tomorrow or a heck of a lot less. So looking at this picture, maybe taking a look at the top picture, you could imagine there's some little probability that a company goes out of business next week that adds a little bit of weight way off to the left, and that increases the standard deviation. Conversely, there's a chance the company could be worth a heck of a lot more because it could be taken over. It adds a little bit of weight way over to the right, increases the standard deviation, right? More risk. Well, that's a little weird if you think about it. And so if you, if you take that to the extreme, pretend somebody gives you a whole bag of lottery tickets. And it's probably reasonable to assume that there's not a liquid market for lottery tickets. Probably no one will pay you to buy your big bag of lottery tickets. So you've got this worthless asset, but it might be worth a ton of money. 
So the standard deviation of, of the possible value of your bag of lottery tickets is really huge, right? Small probability that it's worth, you know, a billion dollars. So the standard way of thinking about portfolio risk in kind of a textbook manner would tell you, well, you have this risky asset, and it's worthless because no one's willing to pay you for it. You would improve the quality of your portfolio by just burning it, right? You don't want to have a worthless, risky thing. And that's obviously not the right conclusion, right? So you can move to shortfall-driven risk metrics, ways of thinking about risk that penalize losses but don't penalize kind of surprise profits. Um, and there, there are a lot of approaches for, for how to do this that, you know, again, if you're interested, you, you can take a look at um, you know, semi-variances and, and other things. Uh, shortfall VAR is one, although there are problems with that as well. So um, a, a lot of issues that can be taken into account in terms of how to model the risk in a portfolio. So that brings us to a just slightly less oversimplified recipe from the one I started with, right? Which is, again, what's the theoretical value for each option or each asset in the portfolio? And there's been a lot of academic work on volatility forecasting and other methods of, of security and derivative valuation, but you need to choose your historical data carefully. Trade selection is more difficult than just buying low and selling high. Um, but you could take steps to improve the quality of the process by looking at maximizing the value of the entire portfolio rather than just looking at each trade in isolation. Um, and take into account the fact that your long-term forecast, if you have one, no matter how good it is, probably matters less when you're trading a very liquid asset. And finally, managing risk. Um, there are some textbook techniques for assessing and managing risk. Uh, in many respects, they fall short, uh, particularly when looking at assets with nonlinear payouts like derivatives. Um, but there are techniques to deal with that as well. Just beware again, even the standard techniques, value at risk, VAR, uh, have some of their own shortcomings, which if I had another hour, I'd be happy to, to talk about. So that's it. Now you know how to build a trading system. Um, good luck and thanks very much.